tonight. If you want to go ahead and open your Bibles, we will open them to Galatians chapter 2. And they will not be on the screen. Galatians chapter 2. Now, who would like to help me recap Galatians, what it's about? Anybody got anything? What's Galatians about? We did chapter 1 last time, so maybe you'll remember, maybe something stuck. I will be offended if nothing did. (laughs) Thank you, Larry. Oh, I did go on that little rant, didn't I? That was kind of <laughs> unnecessary. I just confused you, didn't I? You really need to ask the Lord for a better pastor. That's what I think. I, oh, my goodness. Oh, my. They they want to live under the law. There are There are Christian teachers... And really, they, Paul fights this battle all over the Roman Empire, you know, and, and not that it's the Roman Empire, but it's just the world at that time. The whole world at that time was basically the Roman Empire. And so throughout the civilized world, the message of Jesus has <clears throat> gone out to the civilized world, primarily the Roman Empire, every major city, basically. And if you'll remember in Jerusalem, The church started, they saw the risen Lord, the spirit descended on them at Pentecost, and then the persecution started, and so many Christians left Jerusalem. We've been, just started reading Romans in our youth Sunday school class, and I asked them who, uh, I asked all of my one students this morning, who started the church in Rome, and it wasn't Paul, because he writes in the beginning of his letter, I've been longing to come to you, I've never been there before. And uh, so anyways, um, Christianity has just gone crazy, but uh, many of those good Jewish, especially the Pharisees, the leaders, they have converted to Christianity. They have decided to make Jesus their Lord, honor him as the Jewish Messiah. They cannot let go of the idea that if you convert to Christianity, you must be ready to become a disciple of Moses and follow the Old Testament law. So Laura hit the nail on the head. Uh, The temptation was out there to force all the Gentile Christians to get circumcised. And circumcision has a long and bloody history in the Bible. And that was some of the history that I I did go over that was a little more pertinent. Was Was the word Gauls in there? Yeah, the Gauls were in there. Some people think that because the city and the province of Galatia were named after the Gauls who settled there, that that should make a big impact on how we interpret this. I don't think it does. I think they were pretty Romanized by the time we're, by the period that we're talking about. So, so they're not really that much different from any other big city in the Roman Empire. Uh, they're, they might be descended from Gauls, but they're pretty much Romans by this point. Or you know, civilized folks. Um, but every city in the Roman Empire had a Jewish sex in a town. There were Jews who lived and did very well in many cities of the Roman Empire. And as people fled persecution, they went to their cousin's house or their friend's house or their business acquaintance's house in these other cities. And once they got there, they preached the gospel. And so churches are being started all over the Roman Empire. It's going to take over. And, uh, but as you also well know, many Gentiles accepted the message of Christ. And so you've got these Jewish believers who know the Old Testament and they could teach the, uh, the Gentile believers what they need to know. But in the confusion of all of that, there were Jewish Christian teachers who said, you must be circumcised. You must obey the law of Moses and probably started to throw other things in there. Like you can't eat pork. They definitely did have a conflict over whether or not you could eat meat that might have possibly been sacrificed to false idols. 
because the pagans weren't stupid. They knew those idols weren't going to eat that pig that they <laughs> that they sacrificed to it. So they would have a big barbecue, you know. Today we have a we'll have a big cookout and festival and part of the reason I've always loved these town fairs is because you got the good food. That goes all the way back to pagan times. You sacrifice this big animal, big old cow, big old pig to this pagan god or even in the Old Testament to the one true god. And uh, But let's face it, the gods don't actually need it. So we eat it and we have a grand old time. We have a big festival. And yeah, in Colossians, yeah. That there, there was Paul. Paul came out in favor of a nuanced position that said, "You know what? If you're trying to tell some Gentiles about the Lord and they invite you over for dinner, don't, don't tell everyone in the whole room. Oh, hold on, put the brakes on. Was this sacri was this part of a sacrifice to something? You know, because I definitely can't eat it if if it was. And and uh, Paul says, don't worry about doing that. If they mention it." Maybe you should probably not. Maybe you should probably say, I, I can't really eat this. If a brother comes to you and says, don't eat that, it was sacrificed to an, to an idol. Okay, maybe then you probably shouldn't do it. But, but whether or not it was sacrificed to an idol or not, that doesn't affect you. We know the idols are just made of stone. We know that it's still meat that God made and put on the earth for us to eat. Amen, hallelujah. And, and, uh, and so it, it really, you know, it, it's not about, it, it, it's not your sin if you accidentally eat it. And so anyways, um, can you imagine, can you imagine if we had a, uh, I, I just can't imagine living in that kind of world. Now, maybe there's probably some places in the world where you could go today. And as they welcomed you into their home, they would set something in front of you that had something to do with, uh, Eat what you, they put in and front of you. Was a picky eater. Oh was yeah, he he had other home. reasons for not wanting to do it. He was a picky eater. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I I was just watching on PBS um, the, things that we would think are unusual that people do for their religions, and actually they showed a very large, ornate Hindu temple, and I couldn't believe where it was, because I've been to London and did not see it there, but it's in London. And they've built, in fact, I think they've built it since I've been there, in 2003. Sometime since then, they completed one of the biggest Hindu temples in the world. And they have a big festival where they feed the gods. And what they have to do is build a mountain of food. And it looks nice. It's all on plates. It's all handled very perfectly. And then the people get to, the worshipers get to come in and eat. So this is still in effect in our world, in very nearby places like London, England, you know, uh, where they make a big deal out of it. And you know what? If they invite you, I would say, unless your church is going to have a real problem with it, go. I couldn't eat most of that stuff. They showed off a lot of cookies and cakes, and I don't eat that anyways. But, you know, go, hang out, watch their festivities. It's really interesting, and tell them about Jesus. Um, now we're going to get into that in chapter 2. We're going to get into that in chapter 2. So, but the main thing is that Paul who used to be a Pharisee of the Pharisees, the strictest Hebrew according to the law of Moses, he now understands that all of that was pointless. It was useless. He was never going to be able to earn God's favor. And so now he relies upon grace. And then you got these teachers coming in saying, you must be circumcised, you must follow the law of Moses. And he says, uh-uh. Jesus paid it all. And this and that's what we get out of it today. Jesus paid it all. Whatever you're wanting to add to the gospel, like you must be saved, you must believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved, and you must tithe. Nope, that doesn't earn you salvation. You must believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you must be a member of a church. No, even that is not going to do it. I mean, by golly, God told them to be circumcised. So if circumcision doesn't make the cut as something that can save you, nothing else does besides believing on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, uh, 
Paul has gone through his testimony from the point of view of I once persecuted the church, I then began preaching and teaching, and I encountered God on my own. And, and this is one of the crazy things about Christianity, and there are many crazy things about Christianity. Who became one of the most important theologians in that early church? Anybody that walked and talked with Jesus while he was on earth? No. Paul who did not walk and talk with Jesus while he was on earth, got saved the same way that we do. Right, on the Damascus road, he had an encounter with God, and he had not, we don't have any evidence that he had known in the flesh the Lord Jesus Christ as he walked, but he was convicted of his sin, he repented, and he believed and received the same Holy Spirit that Peter, James, and John, who walked and talked with Jesus for three years. See, from a human perspective, what I'm trying to say is, it's no shocker that Peter, James, and John are devotees of Jesus and live the rest of their lives for him. Now, I would argue against that, that if it was all false, why did they die for it, right? But of course, they go out, they live out their lives as someone who had lived with Jesus for three years would do. They teach about Jesus for the rest of their lives. But Paul, Paul is the curveball. Paul is vehemently opposed to the Christian religion until he meets with Jesus himself. And all of a sudden, someone who has not even been in the story until this point becomes a fiery preacher for the gospel. And we did not walk or talk with Jesus on the earth. We meet Jesus in a spiritual context just like Paul did. By faith, that's right. And so Paul is our example. And that's why, he, that's why it's such a big deal to him that everybody understands it is only by the grace of God that we are saved. It is only by the grace of God that we are saved. And he didn't learn this gospel necessarily from the 12, from the big wigs in Jerusalem. He met them on a couple of occasions. He goes through that story in chapter one. He met them on a couple of occasions. Uh, and, and in chapter two, we're gonna get into, at one point, he does get examined by them and he makes sure that they understand that what gospel it is that he is preaching to the Gentiles and nobody says anything is wrong. See, Paul's embroiled in a controversy now and he's pointing to the past and saying, now, wait a minute, I ran this by all the apostles back when I started my ministry and none of them said anything was wrong with it at the time. So why is there suddenly something wrong with it now? Why do all of a sudden we have to be circumcised now? Why all of a sudden do we got to follow Moses now when we all agreed back then that all you need is Jesus? Well, there's a span of years. I think, I think I got my years mixed up here because we're going to see after 14 years at the beginning of chapter two. So I think he does go and do some ministry for a while before coming back and, and, and explaining what he, exactly he is preaching to the authorities in Jerusalem, to the Christian authorities like Peter, James, and John in Jerusalem. So there is some time. We know he spent three years in the desert coming to grips with it. We know that Paul, uh, Barnabas... Uh, they did a work in Antioch. And there's another thing, right? Jerusalem is where Christianity starts. They see the risen Lord. The, the spirit descends on them. But it isn't many years after that that Antioch, not even in Jewish territory, becomes the center of Christianity. Because with God, it's not about places and specific people. You know, it's not about where the Pope lives. It's not about where any other spiritual power lives lives on the earth. It doesn't matter that the temple is in Jerusalem. God can have his very influential church in any city or even not in a city. It can, it can be out in the country. Um, but, but Antioch becomes almost the seat, one of the most active uh, churches in Christianity. And Barnabas goes and finds Paul, who has gone home to Tarsus and says, would you come help me in Antioch? 
and they go and they serve in Antioch until God calls them to be separated from the elders of Antioch and go out and plant more churches throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, So there is some time there uh, from the time Paul gets saved. He does get under some good leadership, uh, but he doesn't necessarily meet with all the apostles and get trained necessarily like that. But that's fine because he gets his, what he preaches as the gospel, he got from God, you know, and that's one of his main points. And we get, we, our relationship is directly through to God too. So we can relate quite a bit. Am I? I'll pause for breath now. What do you want to say? Just to do a little further recap, let's back up into chapter 1, and we'll read starting in verse 15, Galatians 1, 15. Yes, Jerry. You know, if you look at Barnabas, who Barnabas, that's what I'd like to be is like Barnabas, because he took the initiative to help Paul where everybody else... That's right. Paul was a bit radioactive. (laughs) And of course, Barnabas was not even his given name. It was his nickname that meant the son of encouragement. He was the great encourager, and he encouraged Paul. Everybody else was worried that this was a ruse to get them all arrested, that Paul really had not switched parties, and uh, and Barnabas took him under his wing. So uh, chapter 1, start verse 15. Paul is, is sharing his testimony. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. So right there, he he wants to know what, you know, he, he, he uh, he's trying to come to grips. You know, this is a big life change. Uh, he was persecuting Christianity. Now he's teaching it but he's got to go away into Arabia for a little bit to try to come to terms with that. Verse 18, Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, that's the Aramaic form of Simon, or Peter, I mean, actually, it's it's, it's the rock nickname that Jesus gave Peter, but it's the Aramaic form instead of the Greek form that we're used to, Peter, and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother, in what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. So he became a new Christian. He had the Pharisee training in the Old Testament, and he now had an experience with the Lord Jesus Christ for himself. And he went to Jerusalem after a time, and he did not, he didn't, he didn't visit the Vatican, let's say, okay? He did not go and get the opinions of every single one of the 11 apostles left that were with Jesus, but he did meet with Peter and he did meet with James. Verse 22, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy and they glorified God because of me. So when Paul's telling of the story, I got saved people began to see that it was real and they were proud. They were glad. I, who once persecuted them, were now preaching for them, now preaching the faith that I once tried to destroy. So at some point, everyone turns on Paul and says, no, 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 your gospel of grace alone through faith alone, that's a problem. We got to get everybody circumcised. We got to get everybody. Everyone has turned on Paul. Okay, now maybe not everyone, everyone, but so many people have that it's it's become a problem, especially in the churches of Galatia, which is why he writes this letter to them. So chapter two, then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. (coughs) I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, 
in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. So Paul's been working. Paul's been going from city to city, preaching, teaching, and getting persecuted. Now, if he's been telling something that is not the truth, that's a big problem. So he makes his way to Jerusalem, and he meets with the apostles, and he proclaims to them what he has been proclaiming to the Gentiles that you don't need to get circumcised, that you don't need all of this other Jewish stuff. You just need to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And, uh, and what we're going to see is no one in Jerusalem has a problem with it at that point. Verse 3, but even Titus, and this is one of Paul's traveling companions, but even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. So Paul, even in the, this story, has a Greek traveling companion with him, a fellow preacher, someone that he is mentoring in the word. And no one at this early part of the story says, hey, that Gentile kid needs to be circumcised if he's going to be preaching in our church. No one says that. Verse 4. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And so he's telling the Galatians, look, since then, false teachers have slipped in and they're trying to change the gospel that we preach but we are not giving in for a moment. We are not giving in. And part of that is so that we can bring the true gospel to you. And that's a great attitude, right? Because sometimes we talk about doctrinal purity just for the sake of doctrinal purity, but I think it's a far better attitude to care about doctrinal purity so that we can give the world a message that will actually do them some good. Any other gospel will not save anybody. The gospel plus tithing will not save anybody. The gospel plus church membership will not save anybody. The gospel plus church hierarchy will not save anybody. They must surrender their total will, their total uh, trying to earn God's favor, that must all be surrendered to the grace of God. And uh, I, I just want to drive that point home. The whole This is what the whole book's about, right? We human beings like to have control. And at the risk of picking on our Catholic brothers a little too much, I'm just going to use some of those teachings as an example, because I'm, I'm still fighting the Reformation 500 years later, okay? Uh <laughs> We hold on to a grudge, you know. But, but you know, if you can say to yourself, I took care of my sin because I went to confession today. Or if you can say to yourself, I took care of my sin because I went to Mass today and took Mass today. If you can say to yourself, it's okay because I did something at, to, to, to erase the wrong that I have done, that's a great relief to us human beings because we so firmly uh, we want to have that control. And so we are very comfortable with that lie. That's what paganism is all about. You keep the gods happy by giving them something, a sacrifice of some kind. And so paganism has a great appeal. In fact, anywhere in the world that you go, uh, and the civilized world has changed this quite a bit, and you know there are Christians and Jews and Muslims, and this doesn't apply to them, but you go to deepest, darkest jungles of South America or Africa or some other remote place and you find people that civilization has not encountered at all. And there might be a lot of stuff about their religion that will surprise you. It's different, but it's, at its core, it is make the gods or the spirits happy with you so that they will treat you well. It, it's the same paganism the world over. The Egyptians and the Greeks and the Romans all spake the same religious language 
because they had gods or spirits or some kind of beings that they wanted to keep happy. Those Hindus, Hinduism has like 50, 500,000 gods. I can't remember. It's some astronomical number. No one Hindu could know all the names of all their gods, right? Whatever that number is. And they just want to keep them all happy and, and sacrifice to so that they will have a good life. And that is your generic human religion. That is the religion that we always come up with for ourselves. And if we have some kind of Christian version of that, where we have done something to help God forgive us or done something that we know we have done and taken care of and makes God happy with us, that appeals to that same emotion inside of us that we have taken care of it. But Paul is saying, no, it takes that faith to trust God that he has taken care of it instead of you have taken care of it. So what we walk in by faith that God has taken care of it, it's very difficult. It goes against human nature to trust God when he says, no, nope, it's taken care of. You don't have to do anything. That's difficult. Because I like to say, nope, I don't have to worry about that. I did my confession. I walked up all those stairs on my knees saying my Hail Mary or my Our Father every step of the way up. I did something. I took care of it. It's taken care of. Now I can rest easy. Nope. Jesus on the cross took care of it. And now you can rest easy. But it runs counter to human nature. And so we are... We, we, it, it may sound like we're talking about one point of theology called grace, but in reality, we're talking about everything. We're talking about the big thing of Christianity. You cannot please God. Jesus came to please God for you. Jesus came to please God for you. And that is a great gift. And no, you don't have to worry about it because it is taken care of it. You couldn't take care of it, but Jesus did. And Paul is all up in arms because someone has come along to say, well, yeah, but there's something else you could do to really take care of it. No, no, no. We can't do anything to take care of it. We got to let Jesus take care of it. You would ask that, wouldn't you? <laughs> Let's ask my study Bible. I don't think... Because we seem to be talking about... Well, this is after Paul's 14 years of whatever he's been doing. He'd been in the wilderness, so to speak, for 14 years before he... At some point in the book of Acts, they will have the Jerusalem Council where they weigh this question of do Gentiles have to be circumcised? That never... Around there sometime. That is never mentioned in Galatians. If they had already done that, Paul should just say, hey, look, we, we won this battle in Jerusalem. We fought this fight. Here's the decision. You know. So this is probably earlier. I was going to say, I didn't think this was a prison epistle, which comes at the end of Paul's life. Um, so it's earlier than the prison epistles, and it's probably even earlier than Acts chapter 15. Um, so it's, it's fairly early. Um, and other than that, I, I, I know that that is a study out there, but I've, yeah. yeah what order Paul wrote his letters in. Yeah. But our primary focus is the theology. The theology in it. And so um, Titus was not, you know, Paul's whole theology was put on trial by the, by the apostles. No one said there was anything wrong with it. When Paul got explaining what he was explaining to the Gentiles, they all rejoiced. And said, hallelujah, uh, God's grace has come to the Gentiles. You brought a Gentile with you. We think he's great too. No one says Titus has to be circumcised. Uh, but then later on, false brothers sneak in. And they claim that 
Christians must be circumcised. Uh, And we're not going to yield to them, he says in verse 5. Verse 6, and from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. And so no one, none of those high-ranking people within the Christian church there in Jerusalem at the time said, oh, your, your, your theology is good, but you need to add this little bit. No, no one added anything to Paul's theology. And Paul's theology hasn't changed, so they must have changed. Um, uh, on uh, Verse 7, on the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to these uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised. For he he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor the very thing I was eager to do. So they agreed that they had different spheres of influence. Peter, James, and John were busy managing the movement of Jews who proclaimed Jesus as Messiah. And they couldn't leave that in order to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Now, if you'll remember, there is that incident where Peter is called to the house of Cornelius and discovers that Gentiles can receive the Holy Spirit. He preaches about Jesus to them and the Holy Spirit falls and they speak in tongues without being circumcised, without being baptized, without any of that stuff. They speak in tongues and it shows evidence that the Holy Spirit has fallen on them just like it happened to Peter at Pentecost. So, um, Paul says, I met with them and they all rejoiced at the ministry that we were doing and now everyone's saying I'm wrong. So what changed? Verse 11, but when Cephas, and once again, that's Peter, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. There was a conflict, a short one, but a conflict between Peter and Paul. Verse 12, for before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party, and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him. So that even Barnabas, see there, Jerry, he's not perfect. Even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? And what that means simply is that before these men that Peter wanted to impress impress, showed up, Peter was happy to live with, eat with, and act like the Gentile Christians that he was around. But, and the only thing that changed was the people who saw him, right? When these Jewish Christians sent by James show up, all of a sudden he can't eat with the Gentiles, all of a sudden he can't be a part of daily life with them. He's got to remain separate, he's got to remain holy, and Paul, Paul's not putting up with it. Paul's a fighter, right? And, and Peter is someone who always tells you exactly what he thinks too. So I can't imagine uh, what it was like for the two of them to butt heads right there in front of everybody. Uh, it must have been pretty interesting. But Peter was in the wrong. He was a hypocrite. He acted one way before he wanted to impress certain people and then to impress certain people He started acting very differently. Now, there's a parallel here between this and Acts 15. James stand up and says, Brothers, why would we hang a restraint around their neck that even our fathers couldn't bear? And he's talking about the law of Moses. And it's a very good point. Why would you expect Gentiles to live up to the law of Moses when Jews never really had anyways? They never really had. Uh, the Old Testament is full of historical accounts of the, God's people turning away from him. And no one could keep the law perfect in all of his points. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, I've kept all of those things since my youth. And we all kind of laugh at him a little bit because no, you haven't. Nobody has. You know, 
And so that is one of the problems with the law of Moses. We can't live up to it. And people want to say, but yeah, theoretically, if you could, wouldn't it be enough? It's like, it doesn't matter. Nobody can. Right. Nobody can. The Jews had the best opportunity to be faithful to God, but they're still human. And they're not faithful to God. And so Jesus came to be faithful for us. And when God looks at me, he doesn't see my faithfulness, which would get me in a lot of trouble. Whether or not I've been faithful, he, would, he sees Jesus' faithfulness. And that makes him incredibly pleased with me. And that's the only way that's going to work out. So, and, and parallel to that, one of the things that Paul challenges Peter with is, before these Jews came, you weren't living like a Jew. So if you're a Jew who lives like a Gen, who doesn't live like a Jew, why would you expect these Gentiles to live like a Jew? Why are you saying they ought to do all this stuff? And you weren't even doing that before these Jews that you want to impress came. So there is a huge blind spot in Peter's understanding, a huge blind spot big enough to shove hypocrisy and in, hypocrisy into. And he does, and, and that's the thing. Many times we do these kinds of things and we don't realize it, right? And I could, I could talk all night about groups that I think are too, too strict on one thing or another, and they've added to the gospel, uh, you know, but what, what, would the, what, would, what would be the point of pointing fingers at everyone else be, right? Now, I do think that sometimes it's healthy to talk about other groups and why we don't do things the same way they do. You know, there are some, and I'm proud of the name fundamentalist. To me, fundamentalist means I believe in the miracles of the Bible, all the supernatural parts. If the Bible says it, I believe it. But some people have taken fundamentalist and run in some, just such a direction for it that there's a certain kind of clothes you got to wear and there's a certain kind of thing, you know, and, and some of that I like and some of it I don't and some of it goes way too far. And, and, you know, my, my little Christian bubble that I lived in on my college campus, you know, uh, it got weird. It got weird. And, uh, and, and, you know, uh, there's no point in just talking bad about other groups, but I'm just saying, you know, there's a reason that we aren't necessarily in that lane. And one of those reasons is because We've got to have a healthy kind of Christianity where we understand that we aren't perfect either. When it comes to uh, other people that are different, uh, first of all, if they don't worship our God, uh, we know they're in the wrong. If they don't worship our if they don't worship our God, we need to tell them about Jesus. If they do worship, if they do worship our God, but they've taken it and twisted it and everything to some degree, say la vie, at least they know Jesus, but sometimes it's dangerous, right? Sometimes it's dangerous and they're out there proclaiming this false gospel and where do we draw the line? When do we say something? Uh, you know, some of us are ready to say something at the drop of a hat, right? That's wrong. I disagree with that. You know, uh, the old joke is we love heretics because they're delicious. You know, we, we're ready to chew them all up. I <laughs> just, you know, we, but, um, you know, and, and I, I'm probably one of the most opinionated Southern Baptists with a fundamentalist streak a mile wide, you know, and, and uh, I want to. We do, we do, we do. So, are we trying to turn them down a Christian or not? That's what it can turn into. That's what it can turn into. I'm a Christian, but you're not. And uh, is that always wrong to say I'm a Christian, but you're not because you don't agree? Well, no, because there's a lot of false Christians out there. So you're not necessarily wrong every time you say, well, you don't agree with us, so you're not a Christian. I mean... 
there, there's a there's a spectrum, right? And I try to explain this to people because I'll say something about the Mormon Church or the Jehovah's Witnesses or something, and 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 some people will get offended. You just don't talk bad about other people's churches, and I and I try to tell them you've got to understand there are some things that even Baptists and Catholics and everybody in between Methodists and Lutherans and every, and, and and Assemblies of God and everybody agree on and groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons are outside of even that okay I can say they're not a church right and then what's really confusing is the community of Christ because they changed their doctrine to come in but they didn't really come in all the way and ugh, and we got them around every little community has a community of Christ around here and they're nice people do I want to say anything bad about them not really and our food pantry wouldn't want to run without them, would it, Laura? Nope. That's exactly right. So they care about feeding the poor and everything. But man, some of their theology is, well, they're not even good Mormons. I'll say that. They don't even believe anything in the Book of Mormon anymore, but they keep it on the shelf. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> well, yeah, it's just like the Baptists that don't read the Bible, you know, but um but, but anyways, you know, Paul identified this as something worth fighting about. If you're going to be telling new believers that they need to be circumcised, you're going to be adding things to Jesus as far as salvation goes, that's worth saying that that is not Christianity. And that's a big, that's a big thing to say, but Paul thought it was worth it. Well, you know, too, he was outspoken all the time. Yeah. Right. But after that, that, uh, you know, it may be, you know, sometimes Peter had to say when he was on Mount Decoration, was the first thing he said, you know. Right. Well, I'm sure after he thought what he said, you know, Jesus said no. And, but Paul, Peter was always doing something. Yeah. But Peter was one of those gung ho guys that, you know, and these guys that he had trained. Or been with him, he he didn't want them to look bad when they had this meeting. But I think Paul was put in that place for that reason to help Peter see his shortcomings. Elsie, you need to go down with mommy, okay? Make me nervous up there. Um, exactly, exactly, and and. So here you go. Our heroes of the Bible are not perfect. Uh, and and keep the main thing the main thing. It's all about the grace of God. And you read Peter's letters. Does he say anything bad about Paul? No. In fact, he says, read Paul's letters. Some things are hard to understand, but they are worthwhile. They are, they are, and he, he basically makes them scripture. He says that they are, they are from God. Paul's letters are from God. And that's quite a statement from someone who's had this little scuffle with Paul, you know. Um, but they're both great leaders. Great leaders. And both so great leaders. You know, as, as Paul done this, I don't think he's done it in an angry or deal, but he is saying, look at what you're doing. You know, he's trying to show Peter where he's shortcoming. Yep. And, and uh, you know, and I heard preacher preach on our tongue, you know, we're Things we can do is say things bad about people that are in our church. Yep. Uh, and sometimes we say things and don't really know the whole circumstance. Yep. That too. That too. You got to be careful I, what you I'm say. I'm sure Peter being called down didn't like it to begin with. But probably after he had a few minutes to think. And I think Paul, with all of his professional background as a professional theologian and his experience being mentored by Gamaliel in the Sanhedrin and everything. I'm sure that, you know, if it had been a smaller matter, he'd have gone to Peter privately. And, but, but it, I get the impression that this was such a big deal to Paul that he skipped, he leapfrogged over all of that and opposed Peter to his face and got into his face and said, you know, this is not right. How can you separate yourself from these Gentiles when Jesus has been willing to save them and live in their heart? You know, 
Come on, Peter. What God has called clean, you should not call common. Isn't that what you said you saw in the vision, Peter? Peter walked with Jesus and Paul didn't. Yep. Yep, and Peter should out by all by all visible any anything you want to say. It, by all reason, Peter should outrank Paul, right? But Paul has the same Holy Spirit Peter does. And so do we. And so never forget that. Peter doesn't outrank Paul. Only Jesus outranks all the rest of us. That's, that's it. Right. Encountered the Lord personally. Yep. Saw the Lord for himself. All right. <clears throat> and we'll, let's go ahead and get into verse 15 and we'll, We'll continue with the theology here. And as, as Paul is recounting this, in, this, this confrontation with Peter, and he's just asked him, how can you, for if you're a Jew and you refuse to live like a Jew, how do you expect these Gentiles to live like a Jew? Verse 15, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Now, of course, uh, Paul is kind of using this term kind of flippantly. He's throwing it back in the face of, uh, his his political enemies here. Well, we're born Jews and we're not Gentile sinners. He would never turn to the Gentiles and be like, you guys are born Gentiles, so you're Gentile sinners. No, they're Christians. But he's throwing it back in the face of his Jewish accusers. We're not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. So whatever Jews thought, I'm saved by the grace of God and I was born to this and this is my birthright, guess what? You can't hold that over the Gentile. And sometimes, and we get this way in our churches today, you know, well, yeah, maybe you're a Christian too, but my grandparents helped build this church. You know, it doesn't matter. Same salvation. Same salvation, same grace of God. Verse 17, but if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not, for if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. So Paul, uh, Paul says we always had the law. And if we could be saved through the law, what was the point in Jesus dying on the cross? And, you know, if you could do anything, not just the Old Testament law, but if there's anything you can do that'll make you right before God, that'll make God love you more, that'll, you know, then why did Jesus die? For Paul, Jesus is this big glowing thing at the center of the universe. And anything, anything that distracts from that is a huge problem. And, and I, I wholeheartedly agree, you know, uh, and I, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm professionally good, right? I'm a preacher when it comes to being, you know, what was it? The, the young women were talking about the kind of men they'd like to marry in the future. And one of them said, I'd, I'm going to marry a banker. So I can have money for nothing. And, uh, I want to, and the other one said, well, I want to marry a guy with a clothing store so I can have fine clothing for nothing. Another girl said, well, I want to marry a preacher so I can be good for nothing. And, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, those of us who are professionally good, which unfortunately is what the pastor amounts to sometimes, guess what? We're as bad as anybody. You know, and we've seen all the scandals. The, the, the world has become jaded and cynical. Oh, you're a preacher. So you like little boys. Huh? No, and I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's gotten really bad. Uh, but um, does any of our sin mean that Jesus didn't 
wasn't victorious over sin. Absolutely not. Jesus is victorious over sin. Paul has this whole pedigree and credentials of Jewishness to fall back on, and now he knows that it all pales in comparison to Jesus. It all pales in comparison to Jesus and what Jesus did on the cross and what Jesus is doing living in us or his resurrection from the dead. There's just nothing in the world better or more important, you know? And I mean, there's Moses, there's Abraham, there's King David, there's the wisest man in the world, King Solomon, and they all pale in comparison to a carpenter's son who probably never traveled more than 100 miles from his home, who never wrote a book. And if we looked upon him as the prophet Isaiah says, there was no form of comeliness that we should desire him. But he's the most important person in the history of the world. Nobody says Caesar is Lord anymore. But over 2 billion people in the world say Jesus is Lord. You know, and so uh, what what the rest of the world, what the what the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And this Pharisee of the Pharisees is here to tell you that the only reason he's in good with God is because somebody else died and paid for his sin and that there is nothing you could do to ever do more than G what Jesus has done for you. Yes, Larry. That, that's what it works out being. And, and Paul talks about that more fully in Romans, I believe. You know, of course, there's going to be quite a bit of it here. But, but you know, God gave it to us for a number of reasons. Uh, and, and we always, we always quote that line, but the law is death. You know, and it's like making it sound like, yeah, God was a jerk in the Old Testament when he gave us the law. But now he's nice and he forgives us. No, 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 no. The law was always good. And Paul makes that point in Romans. It wasn't the law to blame. It was our sin that was to blame. The law became our enemy because of... Yeah, our, yeah. the law became our enemy. Came to fulfill it. He's on the same side as the law of Moses. And he's there. Yep. Fulfilling. Fulfilling. Fulfilling the law. Fulfilling the law. And, and um, you know, Jesus, he, uh, I, I lost it, whatever I was going to say. <laughs> and what it winds up doing, what it winds up doing is telling us what's wrong with this and how we will never be good enough. That's what it winds up doing. Well, you know, so, something I think that we miss with the law is it shows us the heart of God. Because how do you treat the non-Hebrew in the land of the Hebrews? He's a stranger. You're kind to him because you were once strangers in the land of Egypt. You know, uh, but there's a purity requirement. You know, no one is allowed to worship idols within your borders, you know. And everyone, even the sojourner in your land, needs to take the Sabbath off, you know. And and every 50 years, all the property comes back to the original family. <laughs> and we don't think they ever did that, you know. Uh, every seven years, the slaves go free. And every 50 years, the, the property comes back to the original owners. That's the heart of God. That's the heart of God. God is very forgiving in the law. Someday, I think maybe even after Galatians, you know, it's like, I want to study the law and I want to point out these things about, you know, the heart of God. This is how you treat strangers. This is how you're generous because generosity is built into the law, you know. You get that back in the uh, Moses, Moses law, Moses law. Yes, yes. All 612 or whatever little regulations, you know, uh, there's a lot in there. You got to be kind to your livestock. And you got to, you know. Then you've broken the whole law. You've broken the whole law. And who was the worst sinner? Moses. He broke all Ten Commandments at once. 
When he came down off the mountain. That's right. I'm full of jokes today. I've been with my mission friends yesterday. That was the original law. Do what now? That was the original law of Moses had that God gives the nation. The the tablets. And then they added two. Well, yes, yes. And then by the time Jesus comes along, they have added to those six hundred and twelve laws a shelf right. full right. of books. And uh, the well, you couldn't spit in the road on the Sabbath because it might turn over dirt, and that's plowing, and that's working on the Sabbath. So, no joke, no joke, no joke. So, all right. Help man live with man, and man live under God. And, but we never could live up to it, so. All right. We did actually, against all odds, get through chapter two, so. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention and your discussion and your questions and... Uh, but, of course, we study Galatians so that the true gospel of grace can penetrate our hearts and lead us to great things like it did Martin Luther in the Reformation. The world changed, you know, and uh, God can do it again. So let me close us in prayer and then we can get the kids back in the fridge because they are expired. So. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for all you've given us. We thank you for your love and your kindness. And I just pray that, um, Lord, we got finger pointing all over the Southern Baptist Convention. That Beth Moore doesn't think we're Christians and we don't think she's a Christian. And all of these things, Lord, I pray that you would help us to focus on grace. Oh, Lord, the kind of grace that you extend to us the kind of grace that is um, not just our grace one to another, but your free gift of grace that covers our sins and that lifts up our head. And we don't need to go around looking for some way to prove who we are in you when you've already taken care of it and we can have the confidence of who we are in you and no longer have that chip on our shoulder. In Jesus' name, amen.